Welcome, and thank you for joining me for another episode of the Monica at Home series. My name is Colleen Casey, and I'm a systems engineer for the Keck Observatory on the summit of Mauna Kea in Hawaii. I'm going to be talking to you today about what our director Hilton Lewis calls as one of our killer apps, Adaptive Optics. Twinkling stars may make for entertaining nursery rhymes, but they are the bane of an astronomer's existence. So we want to untwinkle the stars using a technique that Keck and many other observatories around the world use called adaptive optics. So what makes the stars twinkle? It's the same reason why spoons appear to bend when they go from the water to air in a glass. It's because the different densities between water and air causes the light waves to be refracted. This can also occur when the densities are different because there's pockets of warm air versus cold air. This can also be called turbulence. And we've all seen it when we've been driving down a hot road and the images in the distance appear to waver. But turbulence occurs in many places when we're trying to do astronomy. The first is due to heat sources in the dome. We try to minimize these by putting the electronics outside the dome in a separate computer room and by air conditioning the dome during the day so it doesn't become warm from the sunlight. Turbulence can also be caused by wind flow over the dome and we can get some pretty significant winds at the summit of Mauna Kea. The boundary layer is another source. This is the first 3,000 feet or so of the atmosphere. And you can imagine the air over an asphalt parking lot could be much warmer than that over a nice grassy field. In the fourth area where there's a significant amount of turbulence is in the tropopause, which goes up to 30 to 40,000 feet. And we've all have felt this turbulence when we've been flying on airplanes. So what does this turbulence do to astronomy? Well, if you look at the far right image, you'll see what would be the perfect diffraction limited image of a distant star. But as we take a longer picture of it, it starts to bounce around due to the turbulence and becomes this scatter. And if the star is dim enough that we need to take a long, slow exposure, then instead of a single point, it becomes a big blurry blob, making it very hard for the astronomers to determine the exact size and location of the star they're observing. So light travels from distant stars in waves, the same that a rock thrown into a pond will make a ripple or a wave. And these waves can be shown as either the waves like a ripple or light rays that show which direction the waves are going. Now, as you get further and further from the star, these waves, these rings get larger and larger so that by the time they reach Earth, they look like they're straight lines. So you have these perfectly straight lines called plane waves that have been traveling through the ether, through the universe for hundreds of millions of light years in perfect clarity. And then in the last few nanoseconds of travel, they hit the turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere and they become distorted and the light rays are no longer parallel. So if we can measure how much they've been distorted, we can try to fix it. So how do we measure it? Well, when light waves are parallel, they all come to a focus through a lens at a single point. So what we do is we create a set, a matrix of little tiny lenslets that make a bunch of multiple images of the same star. Now, if we have a perfect planar wavefront, as it goes through these lenslets, the stars make images in the center of each one of these squares. But after they've been distorted by our atmosphere, the circles, the dots are no longer centered in the squares and we can measure how much they've been displaced and that tells us how much distortion that part of the light wave went through. So how do we fix this distortion? Well, soon you have over here a perfectly planar wave just like would be traveling through vacuum of space and it manages to go through a perfect cube of hot air. So this little part gets to go faster than all the rest. So what we do is we bounce it off a mirror that has a dimple that's half the depth of this distortion so that this leading edge has to go a little bit further before it gets reflected and then has to go a little bit further on the way out so that by the time it gets bounced off the mirror, everything is lined up again and it's been corrected. 
So in 2D, you can see the image that would be hitting the telescope and it's all warped and rippled. And then we have this deformable mirror that has the ripples that are exactly conjugate or opposite of that. So what's reflected off of it is a corrected wavelength. And this is what we would send to the scientific instrument. So this is a picture of the deformable mirror without the glass on the front. And you can see these little rods. These rods correspond to each one of those little lenslets that I showed you earlier. And they push against the surface of the mirror to deform it. Now they don't have to push it very far. Since light wavelengths are so small, these rods only need to move the surface of the mirror up to plus or minus 30 microns, which is less than the size of one strand of hair. So this is a picture of our actual deformable mirror that we use at Keck. This one is when it's in the lab and they set it up to reflect a picture of one of our coasters. Fun fact, this is when the, we only had one telescope at the summit instead of two, which is why there's only one mirror described here. And then this is the picture of what the deformable mirror looks like when it's sitting on our AO bench. So to put it all together, you have the distorted light coming from the star. It's reflected off of the deformable mirror, which is distorted in the opposite direction so that you have a corrected wavefront. Some of the light goes through a beam splitter to the science camera now that it's been corrected. And some of the light is sent down to the lens lit arrays, which are imaged on a detector or a camera. And those location of those dots gets sent to the control system, which then tells which rods and how much they need to move. Now, the first time through, the mirror would be flat. And so the image that the science camera would see would be distorted. But as we go through this loop more and more, we can correct more and more of the distortion. Now it'll never be perfect, but it can get better. But you have to have this running faster than the distortion is changing in the sky in order for the image on your science camera to look good. So the one piece I haven't described before yet is this beam splitter that sends some of the light to the science camera and some to the lenslets. So a beam splitter is basically works on the same principle as a one-way mirror. So a one-way mirror is sprayed with silver on only 50% of the surface. So inside a nice bright room, you see the light reflected off that 50% of the mirror and it looks like a normal mirror. If you're on the dim side of the mirror, you see 50% of the light coming through and you can see what's going on in the room beyond. Now we don't use exactly the same technique because we don't want to lose half the light going to the science camera. So what we do is instead, we use a piece of glass called the dichroic. And this has a special coating on it that reflects or allows the light to go through based on wavelength. So this picture is an actual picture of a dichroic we're gonna put in a new instrument called KCRM. And it's designed to selectively reflect or transmit the light based on wavelength. So what you see here is this coating is reflecting all the blue light, which is why the image of the technician looks blue and all the red wavelengths go through. And you can see that why the fluorescent lights look red on the other side and then white as they go beyond the edge of the glass. So this is what we use in AO where we divide the light that goes through the science camera versus the light that goes to the lenslets based on what wavelengths the science wants to see. So they get all the light of the wavelength they're concerned about. And we use the other wavelengths of light to do the corrections for the turbulence. So how well does adaptive optics work? On the left is the picture of a Uranus without adaptive optics turned on. And on the right are the same images of Uranus with adaptive optics. And you can see that with adaptive optics, you can get much more detail and clarity for the same image. There's some restrictions though. The turbulence in the atmosphere changes very quickly. That means that we need to do these corrections very quickly to keep up, more than a thousand times a second, which causes us to need very powerful computers. But it also means we need a new image very frequently. So we need a bright star, what we call a guide star. 
this guide star also has to be very close to what you're trying to study so that the light that the guide star goes through is the same kind of turbulence that your target is going through. The light from your target has to be going through the same area of turbulence or your corrections don't correct for what you're studying. Unfortunately, less than 5% of the sky contains a star bright enough to be able to do adaptive optics. So how do we compensate for that? We create an artificial star using a laser that we can point to anything that we want to study. So here are some images of the actual lasers on the Keck Observatory, and it's projected into the sky from the back of our secondary mirror. So how does a laser create an artificial star? Well, in our atmosphere at 95 kilometers in altitude is a thin layer of sodium atoms that are formed there by meteors who burn up as they re-enter our atmosphere every day. So our laser light sends up energy that excites the electrons that are normally in this ground state and gets them into an excited state. Now they won't stay in that excited state and when they decay back to their ground state, they emit a photon which puts off light. Now if our laser gets enough of these sodium atoms excited, then enough of them emit photons to create a bright artificial star. Lasers can be dangerous. We have a lot of safety protocols in place to make sure we use them safely. The laser comes out of this launch telescope down here at the back of our secondary mirror. And if we think there's any chance our personnel could be harmed by it, we turn it off. This green panel up here is constantly listening for T-pad signals. All aircraft have a T-pad or transponder, which sends a signal constantly saying, I am here, I am here, I am here. And if we ever detect that an airplane is flying over the summit of Mauna Kea and could be blinded by our laser, we shudder it as well. And the third reason why we shudder our laser is if Spacecom tells us that our laser could potentially impede on satellites in orbit and maybe damage their delicate sensors. And we always shudder the laser when they ask us to for that reason too. So what's the future of adaptive optics? Well, as we all know, cameras and the detectors inside them are constantly getting more sensitive and wider field of views and improved technology. We also are constantly improving how fast our computers run so that we can keep up with the rate of change of turbulence. We can get better deformable mirrors, meaning that we can put smaller rods closer together and get closer and closer to perfectly correcting the turbulence that we can now measure with our better cameras and faster computers. And we can also increase the number of guide stars that we create on the sky so we can correct for a larger field of view. Adaptive optics is going to be a game changer for ground-based astronomy for years and years to come. And it has already enabled astronomers such as Andrea Gez and her team to win the physics Nobel Prize for her study of stars orbiting the black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy. I hope you've enjoyed our presentation today and thank you for joining me at the Mauna Kea at Home series. You can watch our other episodes on our YouTube channel, Mauna Kea Astronomy Outreach Committee. Aloha.